surprised Ian never made a short joke this morning. We're making progress. Yeah. <clears throat> Sanctification, Ian, it's working on you. Um, here's what I'm going to get you to do. Would you mind standing this morning? Just, just a quick stand up. <clears throat> you know, um, get a feel for your body, uh, your arms, your legs. You know, uh, some of you already don't like the message because I made you stand after you're just sitting. And then you can sit down and you can take a quick breath. Our bodies are incredibly fascinating machines, if you think about it. I don't know if you paid attention to biology class. I didn't really, but I Googled things. I mean, school must be so much easier with Google now. I'm telling you, the amount you can learn. Anyways, um, do you know every single second, every hour, every day, your body, without skipping a single beat, irrigate, clean, oxygenates, and constructs? I want you to put your hand on your heart, okay? Your heart beats every day about 100,000 times. It pumps about 7,500 liters of blood throughout your 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels every minute. Now, if you don't feel your heart, that's a problem. Uh, but that's your heart. Your liver, I won't get you to put your hand on your liver. Your liver, it's difficult. Uh, you won't be able to do it. If you can, you should be in the hospital. But your liver performs, it says more than 500 essential functions. It contains 300 trillion specialized cells and filters about 1.7 liters of blood per minute. Incredible. The body's uh, five liters of blood flow through the kidneys 36 times a day, which means that every day 180 liters of blood are filtered by our kidneys using a million filter units. And if the nephrons were stretched from end to end, they'd say that it would be about eight kilometers long. That's all inside of you. It's gross. It's all inside of you. It's amazing, though. A piece of brain tissue the size of a grain of sand contains 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. Information runs between neurons in your brain for everything we see, think, or do, and they move information up to the speed of 400 kilometers per hour about as fast as some of you Edmonton drivers drive. And your eyes, say, contain around 107 million light-sensitive cells. And seeing is so important that it takes 50% of your brain's function. The eye has over 2 million moving parts, contains 7 million cones, which help you see color and detail, and 100 million cells, called rods, which help you see better in the dark. Your hand, if you look at your hand, is a collection of 27 bones, 29 joints, over 123 ligaments, 31 muscles, 48 nerves, and 30 arteries. Crazy. Why do you need to go to med school when you got Google, right? Like, this is all you need to know. They say your fingertips are even more sensitive than the human eye, which I didn't know. It's crazy. Hands are remarkable for walking, for uh, sorry, holding hands, loved ones, walking dogs, gardening, all these things, riding a bike, driving a car, texting, cooking, mowing a lawn. I mean, Im imagine all the things that your hands do. We have this incredibly complex, wonderfully designed and created body that allows us to live, to move, to experience the earth, to experience each other. Like, do you realize the amount of trust that we put in our body every single time we go to sleep? Like, if you take a Sunday afternoon nap, you're going to sleep hoping you wake up. That's a sobering thought. Some of you are like, I'll never sleep again, right? Our, our bodies are these incredible machines, and we know it. I mean, usually we, we kind of take advantage of our body. We don't recognize all these things until something goes wrong in the body. We get sick or we need help. You begin to realize, oh my goodness, I rely on this thing for so much of life. We are a fascinating creation. But no matter how amazing we are, it doesn't stop us from thinking that I wish we could just be a little bit better, right? We spend an average of 1,700 a year on beauty products. Well, I don't, but I'm sure some of you do, in cosmetics and services. The entire physical activity economy is now valued at $828 billion globally, which means the Canadian gym, health, and fitness industry is worth $6.2 billion in 2022, and it keeps rising. In 2023, the global self-help market is estimated to be valued at $41.2 billion US dollars to go up to $81.6 billion this year. Even influencers 
The people that often we look to for advice to become better. Hey, what are they doing? How are they cleaning their home? How are they cleaning their dog? How are they cleaning their hair? How, I, they clean so many things. There's all these influencers. They say this market is a $21.1 billion industry. To put that in perspective, they say that if we gave you $1 billion and you got to spend $1,000 a day, it would take you 2,740 years before you went broke. That's a lot of money. We put a lot of effort into this desire and this idea that we could, should be a little bit better than what we are. I get it though. So there's this guy named Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I love this guy. I don't know why, I just really like him. It's probably because we pretty much look the same. He's almost as built as I am, right? And so, but I remember seeing, and it wasn't this exact picture, but he, it was years ago, he put this picture of him on Instagram and he was on his private plane like he is now, but he had this like huge spread of sushi. And I remember I had this gut level sense like, oh man, I wish that was me. Like I wish I had a private plane. I wish I was flying to Hawaii like all the time. I wish I had movies. I wish that this was, you know, I don't even like sushi, but I wish I had that plate of sushi. There was this, this and I gotta be honest, it was this gut level desire to want to be something more. It was like a bit of an ache. I mean, I had a job, I have a job, I have an incredible family, I've got a great life, but yet there's still this thing in me that said, if only I had a little bit more. And interestingly enough, we read that compared with their grandparents, today's young adults have grown up with much more affluence, slightly less happiness, and much greater risk of depression and assorted so social pathology. Our becoming much better off over the last four decades has not been accompanied by one iota of increased subjective well-being. That's a crazy. See, we're people prone to think that better is always somewhere else, aren't we? We have this incredible gift that is our present reality, the people in our life, the bodies that sustain us and our living, this church family. And... But we're often wondering if maybe things are better over there, wherever that is, just around the corner, somewhere. It's why so many of us have helped this Nigerian prince in hopes that we would get riches back from him, right? We fall for this stuff over and over again because we wish there was more. And the crazy thing is this, is that none of us are blind to it. We all know this. We know that this life of pursuing the next experience, the next goal, the next million, the next whatever it, whatever it is, is, is a life of chasing shadows because we know that it's never enough, is it? You're never going to ask someone, when is enough money? There's always a little bit more to be made. There's always a cost to this too. I mean, you look at some of the richest people in the world, the top richest people, and all of them have broken families. It's why, you know, often one of the things that we hear with a lot of people who, you know, at the end of their life, they say, what do you wish you would have done with life? And almost none of them say made another dollar. It was, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have spent my time with things that are very important, that made the most difference. See, a life of chasing experiences isn't an exchange we're supposed to make for the life that we have now, the life that we're now responsible for, that we're called to be in. Now, it's okay to have ambition. It's okay to want certain things. But if in those things that we find are worth, isn't that where the problem comes from? The human ambition machine is meant to be watched really carefully because of this. And I bring it up, I bring this all up because we can't think that this human reality, this human ambition machine doesn't actually creep up as well in our spiritual lives. Often a desire for more of God is really just we want more experiences with Him rather than actually taking the time to know Him. So this man in our passage that we read in John 4, he was most likely a government official who served uh, Herod Antipas. 
And the way Jesus addresses this man, he says, you people. So he's not addressing really the man. It's more of a, a plural. He, he's using a plural form. So he's talking to this general people here. You people and how the text opens with Jesus not being accepted in his own hometown. We're getting the idea that people had welcomed Jesus when there were signs and wonders, but they gave him no real honor for who he actually was. Unlike we read in, in, before in John 4, the Samaritans, we read that they embraced him as their hope. In fact, they asked him to stay with them because they believed who he was. So let me read it one more time for you. So again, it's in John chapter 4, verses 46 to 48, in which I'm going to read. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. While this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. And this is how Jesus responds. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Now, when we read this exchange between Jesus and this man and all the people here, we kind of get a sense where it's just like, is it okay to ask him for stuff? Because it seems like he didn't really respond very compassionately. Is it okay to ask and believe for something great, to seek out his wonder? Like, at what point does wanting God to come through the wrong way of asking him? Like, I'm not asking Jesus for a jet, but would you mind a healing God? Now, I, I want to clarify. Jesus isn't addressing this man's desire for his son's healing or even our longing for God to answer our prayers and for healing. In fact, when Jesus teaches, about, uh, teaches how to pray, he includes in there, make sure you pray for your own needs. Give us today our daily bread, the sense of source, would you provide for me? So we're taught to pray for those things. And I know some of us have very big prayers. Some of us have very big needs. Some of us are really hoping that God answers certain things. Some of us are just wanting to hear from God. We want to know who he is. But this is not what's happening in this exchange. What he's addressing is something a little more subtle and something that actually could be very detrimental to our spiritual health if we're not careful, if we don't recognize it in ourselves. I'll explain it this way. I'm finding one of the hardest things about raising kids I mean, aside from them cleaning the rooms, brushing their teeth, picking up after themselves, we literally had one of our kids clog the toilet before we had a showing in our house two weeks ago. So whoever came to see our house had a great surprise. That's not the hardest thing about raising kids. One of the hardest things I'm finding about raising kids is this, is that even when they don't get their way, that mom and dad are still good. that we still have their best in mind, that we're still trustworthy. And see, what Jesus is addressing here in this exchange happens to me sometimes. Maybe it happens to you. Our obedience to God sometimes can be predicated on what he does for us. Without sometimes realizing it's easier to chase after the next experience with God than to be obedient to him here and now. And that's hard because for some of us, we're in a hard place. This man had a very real need. His son was sick, was dying. That's a real need. Sometimes it's hard because some of us are bored with here and now. We're just bored. We just want more. For others, it's hard because it's hard to give things up. And we're worried about what he asks from us. And so he tells all those listening, and he tells us this morning, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. And, and, and this is really his challenge. His challenge is this. Will you take me at my word even when you don't see what you're longing for? Now, I know that this doesn't happen to any of you in this room. I get it. But what, what do the signs of that look like? What is he addressing? What would it look like in our life? It means it would look like God's goodness is tied to him answering your prayers. Whether he does or doesn't. I mean, I'll explain it this way. If he doesn't, do we still consider God good, 
for us, trustworthy? Will we take him at his word? But what if he does answer your prayer? Is that why he's good? Is that when he becomes good? It may look like our longing is for experience over obedience as we follow him. Now, I'll explain. I had some friends years ago, and um, they were the kind of people that always sought out wherever revival was happening. They would look for deep spiritual experiences constantly, over and over again. And, and it's good to seek out the presence of God. But what I found in them over a long period of time is that it was never enough. They were never fully satisfied. Why? And I don't know if there's kids in this room, but I'll explain it this way. Because that's like having sex without the intimacy. Sex is really easy. I don't know if you know that. Most of us, you know, having sex is a very natural instinct in a sense. You know what's really hard? Intimacy. Intimacy is really difficult. Building a healthy, vulnerable, and trusting relationship over, hard, over time is hard, but it's good work. Having an experience with God is easy. Obedience is hard, but it's the obedience that leads to a better, richer experience, isn't it? We experience that in all of our relationships. Or it seems like maybe when God's best was in the days of old. Now, we should honor what God has done in the past and hear those stories. We count those stories. But we have to be reminded that God's no longer in the past. He's here doing a new thing. He's moving us along. And the last thing maybe it could look like is that his goodness, like our longing for better, is just linked to whatever we, circumstances we find ourselves in. It leads us to believe that maybe he's not with us, that he's not comforting us, that he does not sympathize with us because we can't feel him. The circumstance we're in, why, how could God do this? Now, let me lighten the mood a little bit. Online dating. <clears throat> I didn't have to do it, but I don't know if you know this, but um, over 80% of couples that meet today are actually done online now. And just for some of you who are doing it, just a little bit of a heads up, they say 80% of people on their online dating profile lie. They do, they lie about their age, they lie about their job, their salary, they lie about their height, which I'd be one of them, I am 6'2", right? Uh, you know, they, they lie about all those things, and they say over 10% of your online dating, of online dating profiles are completely fake. They just want your SIN number, right? We're a little uncomfortable when we have to reveal the real self, aren't we, sometimes? And what I love about this passage, though, is this, is that Jesus knows this about us. Like, he knows we find it easier to follow him when we, when we get our way. He knows it's easier to seem as good when we get what we're praying for and longing for. He knows that it's hard to believe in him when we're not getting what we prayed for. He knows about our longing for more, for better. And the great thing is, is that Jesus meets us right there. Because what Jesus refuses to be and do is be another spectacle for us, to be just another experience. Because I don't know if you know this, but at this time of Jesus, there actually were a lot of miracle workers there were people who would come around town, and that's why often people would meet in the middle or you'd pulled by, by Bethsaida, and, and they would come, and some doctors would come and try some certain things. There were healers that would come through. Just like today, you can go to a concert and get a great experience that makes your skin tingle. You can get experiences everywhere. But Jesus is trying to address the idea of this. At the end of the day, if all you're looking for is experience, is that you will never be satisfied. And here's the thing about Jesus. He's in the business of satisfying. Before the Samaritan woman, right before the story, what did he tell her? He's like, if you drink from my water, you will what? Not thirst again. He wants to fill us with life. So Jesus is like, all these signs and wonders, you can get them other places, but he's like, what will you and I really need is this water that quenches our thirst. And the thing is, is that often when we chase signs and wonders, we miss the Jesus who's right there. And that's what he's trying to get at. So what does it look like then? What does it look like to walk with Jesus? What is Jesus asking from us? And really the baseline is this. He says this, take him at his word. 
That's what it means for you to be a Christian today. Literally today, in this 24-hour span, where you are in the moment, in the family life you're in, in the circumstance you find yourself in, in the joy that you're celebrating, maybe in the sorrow that you're having to live through, it's to take him at his word. We read uh, verses 49 and 50. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, and listen to what it says. Your son will live. And it says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. Very, very important line. There was something that happened here. I don't know if it's how Jesus said it. I don't know if it's just his voice. I don't know if maybe there was compassion. I don't know. We don't read that, but we read that right when he said that, the man had enough faith in Jesus's word to go. And that really is just the heart issue for us. That's kind of where it all starts. Will we take him at his word no matter where we're at? He's calling you and me today to just hear his word right where we find ourselves and to walk it out. So I'll give you some examples. Maybe you're here and you are lonely. You're facing loneliness. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteousness. That's Isaiah 41. Maybe you're troubled. 2 Corinthians says this, praise be to the God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Maybe you hear you're waiting on God. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for good for those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Maybe you feel like God has been distant from you. Hebrews 13, 5 says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Maybe you're unsure about this whole thing. Philippians 1, 6 says this, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out into completion to the day of Jesus Christ. This is his word. And it all comes down to no matter where we're at, I know we want experience, but Jesus is like, would you take me where you're at right now at my word and trust me? It just comes down to that. Because you and I can't control what happens tomorrow. We can't make God do wonders and signs. We can't make him do anything, but we're invited to know that Jesus today who promises that if we drink from his well, if we eat from his bread, we will not be thirsty, we will no longer hunger that he fills us. So this nobleman, in the midst of his desperation, he heard the promise of Christ, he believed it, he trusted the word of Christ. And so I ask you this morning, what does it look like for you to take Jesus at his word today? What is he speaking to you about? What does he want to say? What do we need to absorb? What do we need to walk out But the question is, what if that's really hard, though? What if it even seems a little unfair? Maybe you have very little faith, and it's just hard to take him at his word. And is it a bit of a blind trust? Well, that's why we're called to do it in relationship with him. Now, at some point, it is a little bit of a blind trust. There is, I mean, could you imagine getting married, you're at the altar, and the vows are like, do you, you know, do you promise that, you know, and it's like, well, we'll see. There is a faith in everything we do. And so we're asked to walk into faith. And verse 49 says, the royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. So uh, Jesus already responded, you know, telling everyone, listen, all you want are signs and wonders. And the gentleman's like, he still presses towards Jesus. He still comes in and says, yes, but okay, I get it. I don't really worry about the theology of this right now. Would you just heal my son? And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. In fact, Jesus responds to him and does something about it. And I've learned this, that to trust Jesus usually starts in the small things before you're able to get into the bigger things. And this is why I love following Jesus, because there's a sense of like, just come follow me. Come watch, come listen, come feel, come experience. You build this trust with God in the little things that grow into bigger things. But I just know this. If we don't trust him with small things, we can't expect to be able to trust him in the big things in life. And sometimes when we've been following Jesus and it's really hard to remember all the things he's done, we we have to step back and remember the things he's done in the past. Because he wants us to take him at his word in relationship with him. 
This is an invitation to relationship, to know who he is, to know that he's good, to know that he's hope, to know that he's peace, to know that he can fill and fulfill those longings that you have. And then thirdly and lastly, it's not just in relationship, but also, I think we're also called to watch for his wonder too. I mean, 5153 says that while he was still on his way, his servant met him with the news that the boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believe. Uh, I, I don't know if I've shared this story before, so if I have, I apologize. Uh, I remember me and my wife, me and Catherine, we were in our fourth year of college, we were both married, and we were broke. And uh, I <clears throat> had literally broken my wrist, too. And so we were literally and figuratively broke. And uh, I was at work one day, and no, we were at church one morning, sorry, and I felt like the Lord say, hey, I, I, I just want you to give some money in faith, and uh, like tithe. And I was like, ooh, you know, you do see how much money I don't have, right? And I felt like the Lord say, I just, I want you to do it. And so we did. We didn't have a lot, but we did it. I went to work the next day, and I was on light duties because of my wrist. And uh, I had a manager call me. He's like, hey, we've been calling you all day. And he's like, I just want to let you know that uh, for some reason your resume got buried, but we saw it, and we actually think that you would, your management position. And we'd like to give you a full-time management position. It's a seven and a half dollar raise. And because of my school schedule, I can only work at night. I got an extra bit of money. And I just felt like, man, God, you're good. You're really good. This nobleman asked God, would you heal my son? His responsibility and his calling was just to take God at his word and go. And it was God's responsibility to fulfill the prayer. But his fulfillment only came the next day. We don't know when God does these things. But the one thing this story does tell us is that we need to go to God about these things. That we should be the kind of people that do pray, ask God to come and do something wild in our life, to come and bring healing. But today when we can't control it, the calling is this. Lord, would you just help me take you at your word today? Would you help me be obedient today and trust you with my tomorrow. Why? Because the whole point in this passage, in fact, the whole point of the Gospel of John is this, so that you would believe that he is the Messiah. And what do we hear happen in this man's household? He went home, he told his family, and they all believed in Christ. God wants us to be able to trust and believe in him. And we do that by taking him at his word, we do it by entering into continual relationship with him, and we do it by always expecting God to come through and trusting him with our tomorrow. So here's my three on-ramps for you this morning as we kind of close the service off. It's this. Would you today take a moment, whether it's today or this week, to recount all the ways God has been good to you and the ways that God is good to you currently? Now, sometimes for some of you, that can be pretty hard because you may be in a hard situation, but I want you to think through where is God good right now? The second is this. What are you believing God for? And what do you feel and what do you hear God saying to you in this place of waiting in your circumstance? And lastly, it's to practice taking him at his word and rest in his ability to move on your behalf. Church, why don't you stand? And we'll pray, we'll pray and we'll respond and worship together this morning. Jesus, of course, all of this is just so much easier said than done. But really, this is the Christian practice. It's to come close to you, close enough that we can hear your word, and to take you at it. God, I always needing reminding and just needing to always adjust my filters. And we all do. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you help us to draw close to hear your word, and to take you at it. But God, not in the sense of just because you demand it, because you invite us into a relationship with you, to know the God who is able to bring comfort, the God who is able to bring hope, the God who is able to fulfill and to refresh and to bring life. God, that that is who we know we're invited into relationship with, but also there would be this sense in us knowing that you are the God of the universe 
and that you will move on our behalf. So God, help us to regularly today draw close to you, close enough to hear your word, and Lord, to have the faith to take you at it, to walk with you in it. Jesus, we all need your help. So would you help us do it? And God, I pray that as we do it, we would see the same thing that happened to this, this woman at, this well, at the well and, and this, this man's family, that others would hear of this God and believe in the one who has come to give life and life to the fullest. Amen. Let's worship together, church.